wanted to share a little bit of my trip because it was so interesting when when I got there we were um, doing some work with the Kirk Franklin reunion tour and helping folks get registered to vote and uh, that was a, a very interesting and uh, fascinating experience just to see it was about maybe 10,000 folks uh, in the Little Caesars Arena in Detroit and uh, uh, just watching and listening to uh, folks' enthusiasm, not only for the music, but their embrace of the infusion of stewardship. I call voting and, and social justice the stewardship of our country. Um, it is uh, the overflowing of the love that God gives to us, and hopefully it pours out into our schools and into our neighborhoods and prayerfully some kind of way into our political system. Somebody say amen. And, uh, and helps us to ensure that we can we can forge our country's ethos in a way that cares for the poor and the disenfranchised and the agents of peace and justice and all those different things. And so it was just cool to watch that there was so much enthusiasm. People were like, wow, I didn't know I was coming to a concert only to be reminded of the importance of voting. And it just made me think a little bit about how sometimes we put these uh, compartmentalizations in our lives and don't realize that all of this stuff should inform one another. And uh, although we live in, and we talked a little bit about this last week, about third spaces, right? We, we have meaning making that happens in our home and in our work life, but there's a third space, another space hopefully that brings it all together and helps us be the best person that we can be. And so we left there and we did this launch on voter registration day um, called Vote or Else. And we were uh, in Detroit with some of the hip hop rapper leaders there. And we brought in folks like Killer Mike and I swear Vazo, well, he's from Detroit. I learned all these names, Freeway and Black Sam. And, and who else was out there? Uh, 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 well, I know Beans, B Benny Siegel and uh, 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 Pusha T, praise God. I, I, you know, I'm familiar with Pusha T a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, who else we, we was hanging out with? Uh, 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 Yellow Pain, I was new to Yellow Pain. Didn't really know Yellow Pain, but now I know Yellow Pain, good guy. And uh, Brittany Packnett and his homies, Tamika Mallory, my son, Phil Agnew. Y'all remember Phil, he preached here at the church one time. And, and so we all was just out there in, in the neighborhoods of the kind of most troubled parts of Detroit, just encouraging people to vote. And again, the enthusiasm was off the charts. And it just reminded me again that, man, people are not being engaged you know it's it's and 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 when they got engaged they were enthusiastic they had questions and some of their questions were you know kind of i heard i heard uh, kamala harris isn't black you know ask questions i heard donald trump gave me twelve hundred dollars questions i heard that you know the earth is flat all kinds of questions and it's just interesting to know that there are people in our communities that are living in such isolation that no one really engages them. So we stayed there and then I had meetings with some of the bishops and, and that turned into a meet and greet opportunity with VP Harris because she was coming in town for a big event we did with Oprah Winfrey uh, on Thursday. And, and again, being in that space, I ran into some folks and uh, even though it was a more of a pro Kamala Harris event, it was fascinating because still there were people there that had lots of questions. And it just made me think heavily about how can we as God's people working and engaging and just living our lives be the answer to somebody's question. Rather than the catalyst for somebody's problems. And I'm thinking about that uh, certainly in this message today because uh, as I was thinking a little bit about uh, the lectionary passage. There are a few passages we've been in the, in the book of James for the last few weeks talking about have you got good religion and we're going to move on from that framing but I still found uh, this book of James to be compelling and then I read Psalms 54 and I said Lord have mercy. This feels very appropriate and so we're going to allude to James, but spend our time in preaching and teaching in Psalms chapter 54. I'm going to invite you to head to that passage. And certainly on today, which is the first day of the, was it equinox? Is that how you say that? The fall equinox? Y'all know what that is? That's today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, today is equinox. It's when literally the, 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 the earth is experiencing 
12 hours of sunlight and 12 hours of nighttime. It is these one of these moments throughout history where, you know, before people had, you know, all the tools we use in our modern technological age, they depended on the sun to help them understand the seasons they were living in. If you go to certain parts of the world, you'll still see these magnificent stone sculptures that were built and used, and the sun helped them to understand the changing of the seasons. There's so much in there I could do with that. How the sun can help you understand the changing of your seasons. But that's not my sermon for today, but some of y'all already got a blessing. Amen. Patrick Summers said, I already got my blessing. You ought to say, the sun can help me understand my seasons. Amen. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, uh, this is uh, a wonderful text, uh, an appropriate text I have found given uh, the climate in which we are living. How many of you know we are living in a season and a time where uh, those whom we don't agree with are particularly during election cycles? They are just amplified all in our timeline, our algorithms. You are more aware of them because they putting up signs and stickers and things that you like, wait a second, I didn't know you was one of those. I didn't know you supported that. In times past, you know, uh, it wasn't maybe as pronounced. Maybe it was, you know, how many know you get older, you just notice more things than you did when you were younger. You know, when you were younger, you were worried about, you know, who you who you was going you know <laughs> boo up with he was worried about you know you know yo 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 whatever i don't know worried about other things and then when you get older you start worrying about real things like wait a second I'm like this 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 thing is for real for real well i believe that the difficulty of following jesus in this season um, is largely borne out for many of us in how do we treat our enemies, or at least those we perceive to be our enemies, those who we are conditioned to believe are so other and different from us, how are we to engage with our enemies? And Psalms 54 was a very interesting passage of scripture because it introduced uh, the imprecatory prayer uh, model to uh, this season of our preaching and teaching. Uh, I love the lectionary because it usually introduces themes to us as a preaching and teaching team that otherwise we would not necessarily just go find on our own. How many know when the word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path, sometimes the lamp and the light expose things that otherwise you would not see on your own? Hello, somebody. The, the lamp and the light help you to see things that you would not otherwise see on your own. And that is why it's important to let the word be a consistent part of our spiritual journey, our Christian walk, because there are things happening in your life that you are going to need some lamp and light to help you navigate through. And if the only lamp and light you have is John 3.16. That's a good lamp and a light. I'm not hating on one verse. But how many know that some of our lives are way more complex than just the one verse? That reminds you that God so loved the world, that God gave God's only begotten son, that whoever believes will not perish, but have everlasting life. That's a lot of good stuff. But there's another set of problems and situations that I think the lamp and the light must have access to, and I hope and pray that this text today gives us that light in the name of the Lord. Psalm 54, the scripture comes to us. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version, and the word of God simply says like this, save me. Somebody say, save me. Save me, O God, by your name and vindicate me by your might. Hear my prayer, O God, and give ear to the words of my mouth. For the insolent have risen against me. The ruthless seek my life. They do not set God before them, Selah. Which is just another word for pause. But surely God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. God will repay my enemies for their evil. So in your faithfulness, 
put an end to them. <laughs> With a free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. Verse 7, for God has delivered me from every trouble. So I say every trouble. Oh, let me read that again. For God has delivered me from every trouble. Somebody say every trouble. Can I do it one more time for the Holy Ghost? For God, why don't you repeat it, repeat it with me? Come on, everybody. For God has delivered me from every trouble. My goodness. And my eye has looked in triumph on my enemies. Woo! It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So today we're going to talk about uh, simply how to pray for your enemies. And, and just, just uh, to give you a clear sense of what that prayer is going to be, just simply, I pray you fail. That's the title of our sermon today. I pray you fail. Let us pray. God, we want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for the word of God that has been read for the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in my heart so I will not sin against you. And please send the anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray that the people of the way say amen. 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 I don't want you to look at your neighbor and tell them I pray you fail. <laughs> that would assume that you think they're your enemy. Amen. I just want you to know there's nobody in this church that ain't as your enemy. But there are some folk who are our enemies. And my hope today is as we leave that our prayer will be, I pray they fail. Now, for much of my preaching career, I have tried to avoid preaching on haters. Aside from haters being an affirmation that you are doing something noteworthy, haters likely don't have the capacity, the talent, the opportunity, the grace, or the assignment to do what they're hating on you doing. So I don't preach on haters because it places way too much attention on a human being. When the preaching moment should always point us back to God and the way of life we are being invited to live into. Somebody holler, I ain't got time to preach on my haters. Say that, I ain't got time to preach on my haters. So over the years, my orientation around how I understand my enemies have largely flowed out of my framework for sin. In theology, we call it uh, homartiology. It is this uh, kind of whole category in the theological corpus tradition that helps us to get under the nuance of sin, i.e. rebellion against God and the ways of God and the ways in which this rebellion against God, this disobedience, this, this oppositional posture and stance towards God often works its way in our time, place, and space. And many of you know that I drink from lots of the wells of the Christian tradition. I'm a you know, wonderful uh, appreciator of all the ways that God reveals God's self through Christ Jesus over time to so many different people and groups and cultures that we are a rich tradition. Amen. Even though we may locate and find ourselves firmly planted in a part of the Christian tradition, I want you to know that there's a lot of good stuff in the Christian tradition that will bless us if we just drank from some wells, Amen. deep wells, wells that may not always come from your well. Amen. But if you go deep enough, it will all come from the same source. Lord, have mercy. Amen. How many know that sometimes we don't appreciate that all of our wells are connected because we're too shallow in the drinking from some wells. So we think, oh, my well, you know, my, my well is the, is the Pentecostal well. So there's only, you know, if you, if you ain't drinking from this well, you ain't drinking from the well. <laughs> 
But how many know when you dig deep inside the Pentecostal well, you keep on digging? You run into Methodism at the bottom of that well. You run into Baptist at the bottom of that. You run into Catholic at the bottom of that. You run into a whole lot of Presbyterians and Lutherans, and you'll find all kind of folk at the bottom of the well that didn't show up at your church <laughs> on a Sunday morning. Somebody say amen. Yeah. So you all to holler, I got to keep digging. I got to keep digging because there's life in the well of our tradition. And so one of the great things that I've appreciated about the well, if you will, is that it has helped me to create and give a language to the, the, the kind of theological questions that sometimes my own tradition uh, did not always give me enough nuance to help make sense of the, the, the complexity of human struggle. Uh, I often love Simon Chan. He's an Asian theologian that you all know I, I tap into whenever we start talking about sin. And he says that there are uh, three kinds of sin. The sin within us, that is our flesh. The sin around us, that is the systems and the structures. And the sin beyond us, that is the devil. You know, the devil's business. And I grew up in the Pentecostal holiness context where literally everything was a sin. <laughs> Amen. If you... If you, amen, uh, uh, was late to class, oh, you, you were sinning, sin, sin. Amen. If you, if you, if you, if you watch TV, sinning, sin, sin. Use the microwave, sinning. Went to the movie, sinning. Wore pants, makeup, jewelry, short sleeve shirts. <laughs> sin, sin, sin. I never forget the story my father and him told us that, you know, we was in, this in the 70s, the Holiness Apostolic uh, Church, and they went to a church meeting. They was fellowshipping with another church. I think it was a United Pentecostal Church, UPC, as they're called. Very, very, you know, strict, legalistic, conservative church. We had good church, though, praise God. I mean, the music was amazing. Mm -hmm. Amen. If I had to bring the folk in here, they'd just have y'all rolling on the floor. You wouldn't even know what hit you. It'd just, just be like, oh my God, what's going on? And, but it was, you know, but, but my father and my uncles, they were, you know, from the Bay Area. And so, you know, they were fashionable during the 70s, you know, as much as you, you know, can be fashionable and whatnot. And so they were, uh, showed up to the church and they had on a light baby blue shirt. Uh, I think a, a, a kind of pastel color shirt, and the shirts were short, short sleeve. And uh, you know, one of the mothers came up to them and said, "Son, you standing naked before my eyes." <laughs> <laughs> my dad, uncle, said they looked at the arms. They said, "Man." Sinny, sin, sin, right? Like, 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 we grew up in a time where everything was a sin. How many know when everything is a sin, it cheapens what really is sinful? Hello, somebody. That there must be differentiation when we start talking about wickedness and evil and sin. Because there are parts of the text of our tradition that give us instructions on how to respond to the manifestation of that, which is beyond just the sin and temptation that is common to everybody. There are sins and there are wickedness, uh, manifestations of wickedness and evil that when uncontested create relational fracturing that destroy the humanity, that destroy and harm creation. And when we don't take that seriously, we lose out on God's invitation to all of us to resist that sin and to, in many ways, invoke God's grace, power, and spirit within us to ensure that sin and that wickedness stays at bay and prayerfully over time does not win. It is worth saying unequivocally that all of us are sinners saved by grace in this same homartiology, in this same kind of sensibility that we all are a people who struggle with sin. And even our best righteousness are as filthy rags when compared to the holiness of God. So it is not for us to, you know, start to get on our high horse because how many know that's another danger 
We start comparing ourselves to each other. Well, I'm glad I'm not like them. There's a story in the scriptures. Jesus, the publican and the and and the and the and the priest, if you will, or the righteous person, they 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 were they were uh, literally comparing themselves to someone who, in their eyes, were obviously socially on another level below them. How many of we all get fall in danger of that trap? Because some of our wickedness is. Uh, on display for many people and other parts of our stuff is kept in secret. And so all of our righteousness is as filthy rags when juxtaposed against the holiness of God, the otherworldliness of the divine, the transcendent nature of the uncreated creator of the creation. Mm -hmm. But it is also important for us to appreciate that the interpersonal manifestations of sin are often a result of systemic and structural evil that exacerbate the sin within us in ways that torment both the individual and the collective. Which is just to say, beloved, that I often have observed how the systems of wickedness and oppression in the world are often runaway trains that operate on autopilot. And sometimes our own individual complicity with said sinful ways keep those runaway trains moving fast. And when we're not uh, conscious of the ways in which we are complicit, rather than slowing the runaway train down and prayerfully bringing it to a stop, we like feeding it. Like, oh, let's go more, 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 more and cause more harm than good. I often believe that systemic evil is the uh, ca cascading expression of personal sin. It is our jealousy and our anger and our, and our hatred and our malice individually that collectively gets into these systems and cause these systems to be worse than they would if we all were people with joy and peace and love and justice. Don't you know that one of the great gifts that God has given to us as the church, the salt of the earth, is to help redeem creation, redeem society, make it worthy of God's love and express that in a public and in an interpersonal space. I don't want to come off then as an apologist or defender of sin or wickedness or evil structures, but I have found that my years of pastoral and justice work have taught me so much about poverty, so much about abuse and addiction and trauma, exploitation, racism, violence, war, wicked governance, terrible adults, so many other factors, all of these things, when they are put in systems, they can turn an angel into a demon. When all this stuff gets left unchecked, it could turn an oasis into a desert. It could transform abundance into scarcity. And it is in this way, with this nuance I want to offer to you and I, that you and I have a calling as followers of Jesus to pray for our enemies. The enemies, the real enemies, not your haters. My prayer for you and the haters, you will learn to ignore them. <laughs> Amen. You spend all this time, God, I pray for my haters. Oh, they talked about my hair. They talked about my shoes. They, they talked about my outfit. They talk, and, and they, you know, they talk about how I did this job. And you, you spending all your time praying for your haters. I pray you learn to ignore them. That's my only prayer. No, don't spend a lot, but you ought to pray for your enemies. Pray for your enemies to fail. Hello, somebody. You ought to pray and learn to pray that I don't want my enemies to die. That's not my prayer. Now, if, you know, they do die, then, Lord, you know all things. But that's not my prayer. Somebody say amen. Amen. Because I, I, the slippery slope about praying for all your enemies to die. Because if someone else is praying for their enemies to die, and you, they enemy, 
You don't want God to hear that prayer. Somebody say amen. amen. But you want to pray for your enemies to fail. Yes. Fail at leadership. Yes. Fail at maintaining power over me, mine, and ours. Yes. Fail at their schemes and machinations. Yes. Fail at their oppression. Lord, I pray my enemies fail. Everybody say that. Lord, I pray my enemies fail. Now, when I think of the text today, its original context and even our context today, I want to give you a framework for how the Psalms is a great place to learn how to pray for your enemies to fail. Uh, first of all, the book of Psalms is a book of prayers. It's a book of songs. It's poetry. It's wisdom literature. Some people turn the book of Psalms into a theological book where you extract doctrine, where you develop, you know, positions around all kinds of what in theological space we call essential things. How many know there's some essential things and there's some non-essential things? It, it, this mirrors your life. How many got essential things that you really, it's like a deal breaker? Anybody? Anybody? Essential things. Now, how many got non-essential things? It's like, you know, it's a preference. Some I like, but if you don't have the same preference, then I'm not going to, like, break up with you. <laughs> you know? Like, you know, there's some essential and non-essential things. Like, essential things is probably like, don't put your hands on me. I won't put your, my hands on you. Essential. No violence, no physical, essential. I like the Niners, you like the Raiders. E no, no, non-essential. Non-essential, right? Just give me an example of essential and non-essential. Hello, somebody. Right, right? You like Dre and we like, they like Drake. E not, not. I need some better examples. Somebody say amen. Right? My examples, they burn the line. Some of y'all getting here like, Pastor Mike, I don't know. They not like us. They not, hey, you know? <laughs> there are essentials and non-essentials. And the Psalms are intended to help us color in the essentials. They're not intended to make you have a clear sense of the essentials. The Psalms are our human response. And what's dope about the Psalms, you may not appreciate this, or you should, these Psalms go back almost 4,000 years. 5,000 years, I want you to think about this. There have been people praying and singing these same words to God for 5,000 years. I mean, the Psalms are like, you know, any Star Trek people up in here? It's Trekkies. The Psalms are like uh, 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 Kirk telling Scotty, beam me up, Scotty. It's like, it is transporting you into a timeless space where you are joining an uncounted sea of human beings praying and singing the same words to God at similar moments of crises in their lives. I mean, ain't that deep? That's deep to me. Because sometimes, you know, we think, oh, you know, uh, ancient is, 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 is outdated. But how many know that grief is not a contemporary only feeling. Isolation. Timeless experience. Frustration. Disappointment. Fear. Loneliness. self harm All of these are timeless human experiences. And yet, we have a prayer book. A soundtrack for your life. Lord, have mercy. The song is a soundtrack for the believer's walk with God. Lord, I feel like preaching on a soundtrack. But I got to do a little more work on that. Praise God. I'll <laughs> preach that part two. The Psalms 
is the soundtrack for the God chasers in the room. And when you pray, when you sing, when you quote, when you reflect on the Psalms, you are literally joining in a discursive space that holds people with different languages and experiences and challenges. And you all, we all are finding a home in ancient prayers to God. I love how one Christian mystic characterized the Psalms, listen to this, as a shepherd for your soul and track the prayers of the Psalms on top of the most famous prayer, the Lord's Prayer. How many of us know the Lord's Prayer by heart? Let's just pray that prayer just to get us a little activated in our prayer moment and, and skills. Uh, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. And no, <laughs> like, Mike, I think there's only one or two of them evers now. <laughs> but I love how the writer uh, put the, 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 the different kinds of prayers in the Psalms and laid it on top of the Lord's Prayer. I'm just going to run through real quick because it may be a cool invitation for you and I to think about how we learn to pray for our enemies and certainly pray for all that we don't have to start from scratch. We can start from the most famous prayer we all know. And so uh, the, 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 the writer uh, uh, uses one of the prayers of thanksgiving and praise and juxtaposes that with our Father. Hallowed be thy name. Uh, another part of this writer says that uh, submission to God of one of the prayers found in the Psalms and juxtaposes that with thy kingdom come. Uh, one pra uh, part of the prayer, comfort and encouragement and juxtaposes that with give us this day. Longing for God, give us this day. A confession of sin, forgive us. Prayers found in the Psalms. Anger at our enemies or imprecatory prayers, which we'll spend a few moments talking about. Forgive us as we trespass and also those who trespass against us. Mm. Imprecatory prayers found in the Psalms. Temptation or laments of grief or complaints. Lead us not into temptation. Praying about how can we make sure we don't fall victim to our own weaknesses and devices. Prayers of the dark night of the soul, complaints and laments towards God that make us feel distant. I found that to be very helpful because there have been seasons in my life where I feel like, God, you have left the brother Hank. I don't like what I'm seeing and I'm praying and I need to understand what's going on. And there's all kind of psalms that talk about what the mystics call the dark night of the soul. All of this is in our tradition. And yet, only psalms many of us know is, the Lord is my shepherd. Good song. Not hating on the song. But there's so much more. And so this idea that you and I have a deep well that we can drink from, allows us in this moment, this political moment, this cultural moment, this moment where we are aware of geopolitical conditions, we're aware of the, of the wickedness in our own neighborhoods and cities, the, the, the inequities, the, 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 the ways in which we are postured against one and another, the ways in which we're hearing language and descriptions of our brothers and sisters and loved ones to be dehumanizing, calling them all kind of names. And we are, we are, we're prone to, to only be able to identify with one emotion and that's hatred and anger that often leads to violence. And yet we who are following Jesus are called to pray for our enemies. God, why would you put this scripture in the midst of our lectionary. I don't want to pray for my enemies. This is what I be telling God. I don't want to pray for them. I want them to go away. I do want them to disappear. I do want them to. I do. Somehow I just be like, especially, and I'm a moment of transparency. 
You know, there are people who have transitioned, and I'd be asking God, why them? And why not them? Like, did you, did you get it mixed up? Was the oxygen cutoff valve on the wrong person? Anybody ever prayed that prayer and he's asked that question? No, you ain't prayed the prayer because that's, that, that's unholy. You know, it's like, oh, I never pray that prayer. But you know, ever just sat in a, in, a, in a memorial service or a funeral service and you just, man, God, you, you got the wrong one. And so this prayer, this imprecatory prayer kind of framework is an important one for we who are struggling with theodicy. Why do Bad things happen to good people. Again, a timeless question that the righteous ask, the righteous ask God. Why do you allow evil to persist in the world? Why do you allow children to be bombed and their bones and bodies be spread? Why do you allow uh, uh, white nationalists to, to, to be in a stone's throw away from the most powerful political position in the world. Why do you allow the wealthy to extract so much wealth that you got people living outside and under freeways in the wealthiest region of the world? Why do you allow armies and military and generals and weapons manufacturers and mercenaries to travel into the Congo and into the Sudan and to rip up the original lands of the earth? Why do you allow my chancellors and my CEOs to turn our universities and our businesses into places of death rather than places of life? Just a few questions. I ask God why? And when we don't know that we're not the first ones to ask those questions, some of us run away from God. Say, well, I can't handle, God can't handle my why. That's what the old preacher told you. Don't question God. <laughs> don't you ask God no questions. God is God. He's sovereign and he does what he wants to do. And you get in where you fit in. How <laughs> I many know that ain't God? That's, that's you. You can't handle these questions, and guess what? That's good news. Because you haven't lived long enough to handle these questions. But the uncreated one, the one who is the creator of all things, is not threatened by the creation's questions. <laughs> You can ask God a question. God, be like, who do you think you're talking to? God ain't like that. That's your mom and them. Yeah. <laughs> that's your daddy and them. Believe me, that's my dad. <laughs> Even at 78 years old, you ask my dad the wrong question. He's like, son, who, who are you talking to? <laughs> like, I'm 40, 48 years old. I can ask you, no, 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 son. No, don't lose, don't lose your place. <laughs> okay, dad, my bad. That's not God. Yeah. That's an appropriate relationship with your human parent. But how many know when you don't dig into the wells of your tradition and understand that there have been people asking God questions a long time and God's responses have not been to strike you down with lightning. God, listen, God's response has been to codify a soundtrack for the God chasers so you can be transported into a divine, transcendent, place and have a conversation with a timeless group of God chasers. Lord, have mercy. It's the greatest chat room of all time. You get to be in a chat, you know, chat rooms in a, and just be like, I'm just in here swimming in some questions, swimming in some theodicy questions. I'm trying to figure out and make sense of what I'm called to do. And it is in this context that the imprecatory prayers is one of these categories of prayers. An imprecatory prayer is just a prayer pretty much for your enemies to receive the same judgment that they are trying to put out in the world. It is the prayer for God, the sovereign one, to enact vengeance, to defeat 
the enemies. Now, I'm not talking about your haters again. And I got to say this because some of us just don't have enough nuance. We have preached the gospel that is so individualistic that we think your haters are people that you don't like, that don't like you. How many of you know that God is very unconcerned with the people you don't like and that don't like you? Because I want you to think of all the many times in your life you don't like yourself. And you know what God usually does? Just give you time to fall back in love with yourself. How I many know time is the greatest antidote to outlasting your haters? It ain't praying for them to die. It's, it's, too, it's, it's not enough nuance. God, I pray my hater die. God asks you why. Because they, talk, they talking about me. <laughs> what? I think, I think you're not being formed well. Because there are levels to wickedness in the world. Hello, somebody. You ought to tell your neighbor, there's levels to this now. There's levels to this. I, I, I don't have enough time to talk about all the different ways that our theological tradition creates levels, distinctions, differentiation. How many know that there's a difference between a dictator who's using the force of the state to wipe out peoples? That's different than somebody who, you know, looked at you wrong in a meeting. <laughs> and so you'll lead this service. It's not about the pastor told me to pray for my enemies. And you thinking of the person in your work group at school. No. That's not, that's not what God is talking about. Now, I'm not trying to diminish how hard it is to deal with certain people. Certain people, they know how to bring, you know, some parts of you out that you knew was under the blood, as the old saints used to say. It is like, you know, when I got saved, when I got baptized, I went down a, a, a sinner and I came up a saint. So you get out the water, you be like, ooh, I'm glad that anger part of me is still, still in that water. And then you deal with some people and you be like, man, I must be buried in a shallow grave because I feel like busting your head. You know, you just be like, oh, you just all kind of things. So there are certain people out there that know how to get a rise out of you, right? But I do believe those kind of prayers are not prayers for your enemy. They're prayers for yourself. That's about the sin within us. When people know how to push your triggers and your, your buttons and get you outside of yourself. That's about your own formation, our own ability to be more in touch with the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace. The fruit of the spirit rather than the Deeds of the flesh. But when we talk about enemies, I want you to know, beloved, that there are some folk out here who we must pray that they fail. And when we infuse the Jesus ethic as our guardrail, this prayer becomes a very appropriate way to respond to our enemies. I don't have to just wish for you to fail, I can employ my spiritual power through the Holy Ghost to ensure that whatever my response is through the disciplines of my faith, I can appropriately bring the power of spirit to cause your failure and not destroy your life. It's a hard prayer, again. I, I already told you, that's a folk. I, I just hope, you know, but, you know, I, I'm going to stop focusing on that because I'm trying to teach you how to pray for your enemies. <laughs> so the first way that you pray for your enemies, listen to this, is you acknowledge first your own humanity. Acknowledge your humanity. When you come to pray, you got to come and acknowledge to God that I am vulnerable. Is not that what it means to be human? Many of us have bought into the lie that we are machines. We are producers, manufacturers. We are defined by what we create. And we don't have limitations. How many of you got to sleep sometimes? How many got to 
take a nap and eat. And even Jesus, when Jesus was on the earth, Jesus did not just engage without fatigue. Jesus would sleep in the bottom of boats while everybody else on top was about to perish. Why? Because Jesus was human. Jesus had to eat. He got hungry. Jesus was human. He had to have friends and community. Why? Because Jesus was human. The humanity, our humanity must not be lost in the practice of our disciplines or else you lose out on the regenerative nature of spiritual disciplines. Our disciplines feed us. They keep us alive amidst death. They keep us focused amidst confusion. Our disciplines are like the guardrails. When you ride on curvy roads, they keep you from driving off the end. Mr. Noah Jones, he says like this, God often pushes you to the edge of your mind so you can change your mind. The disciplines are those things that help you change your mind. The way you pray for your enemies first is to acknowledge, God, I'm a human being. I come with humility. I'm fallible. I acknowledge that this prayer is coming from a place of anger, fear, and pain, distress. I come to you, God, knowing that you are uniquely positioned as the transcendent one, the sovereign one, the one greater than anything that has been created. I come to you acknowledging God that I cannot handle this situation on my own. And so that's why I'm coming to you. Whenever you start to pray for your enemies, you acknowledge God and yourself. Acknowledge your positionality. Acknowledge your frailty. Why? Because when you fail to do that, listen to this, I believe you lose your own humanity. When you don't acknowledge your humanity, you start to allow the anger, fear, and pain to rob you of your humanity. You start to create formulations in your mind that make it okay to respond with inhumanity to others' inhumanity. Don't lose your humanity when you learn to pray for your enemies. All right, so first question, let me, let me, let me get here because I, I, I done, I done talked my, my, my time away. What anger, fear, and pain are you carrying into prayer related to your enemies? Some of us are not in touch with our anger, fear, and pain, so this is going to be a tough first step. But I have found when I'm learning to pray for my enemies, I need to first come and acknowledge the harm enemies are doing to me. So I can be focused in my prayer. I can be disciplined in my prayer. Do you allow the spiritual discipline of prayer to help you hold on to your humanity? Again, prayer, communication with God, prayer, engagement with the transcendent one, prayer, the practice that keeps your life and your spirit, your soul and your mind tapped into that which is greater than yourself. Do you allow your prayer life to cause you to hold on to your humanity in the face of inhumanity. Acknowledge your own humanity. Second thing you must do, this is hard, Lord, this is hard. Distinguish between the actions and the actor. When I wrote this point down, I said, Lord, what you talking about, Willis? This, this, because sometimes it's hard to distinguish between the wicked acts of individuals, of systems. But again, I love the text where it says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, wickedness in high places which just means if you can see the person they likely are not the enemy you think they are 
Now, that does not absolve people of responsibility when they do terrible actions. But I want you to know, beloved, that most of the time, our prayers are overly centered on individuals. Listen, as I said earlier in my sermon, who have been turned from an angel into a demon. Because they've been part of systems that have literally stoked the worst part of them. I think of Pookie and Ray Ray and these young people I work with all the time who have done terrible actions. And yet when you speak to them and you get underneath their story, their actions are often a response to a terrible action that happened to them. And if you only meet Pookie after he pulls a trigger, you will not learn that someone pulled a trigger on him. You only meet him as a perpetrator and not as a victim. Think of all the ways in which people whose lives have been harmed by systems, invisible, in high places, are often so traumatized that they cause harm to other people. And because we don't have a sense, this is why I think the ancient life of the text is so fascinating. They had a sense of evil. Most of the time, people, you know, we all smart, intellectual. I got degrees. I love degrees. I love education. One of the most interesting things is the more educated some of us get, the more we ascribe a description to that which other cultures found to be indescribable. You know, there was a time when the, uh, I, I, I was in New York during, at Columbia University doing some stuff there. When the, uh, what's, what's the thing that happened to, uh, oh, McBride, the, uh, uh, when the sun and, the, and, 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 and the, eclipse. the eclipse. Lord Jesus, the eclipse. <laughs> and as I was watching the eclipse, you know, everybody's standing out there with the little glasses on, looking crazy, just looking over there like this. And I took my glass, I was looking at everybody, everybody's looking over there like this. And I was like, man, if I didn't know what was going on, this would look kind of cultish. Kind of apocalyptic, <laughs> kind of like what's going on around here. But it made me think of the, 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 the ways that ancient people without science. Imagine you out in a, <laughs> tending to your goats and sheep and, you know, doing farm work. And all of a sudden, you look up in the sky and you start to see the sun turn dark and the sky turned orange. Imagine the first time you seeing that. You sitting there like, what's, what's going on around here? I don't have no, I don't have no exp explanation for this. So you attribute it to something that is indescribable. And yet with science, it becomes describable. And we have a tendency in our modern culture to explain everything into or fit everything into something that's describable. Well, how many of you will just be honest and say there are certain parts of your life that are not describable? Certain experiences that are not describable. Certain occurrences. You'd be like, mm, I ain't got no language for that. And Big Mama would be like, you know, yeah, baby, keep on living. Let's, let's keep on and keep on living, baby. Right? I do believe there's evil in the world that cannot be described by just a couple of bad experiences. That is the evil that I believe the scripture is compelling us to pray for and against. Not the interpersonal challenges you have with your family member with your coworker, with your neighbor. Oh, they want to turn the music down. I'm praying for them to fail. No. I'm talking about the kind of evil that uses power to destroy the vulnerable. I want to distinguish between the actions and the actor. I want to make sure that when I pray, I'm clear that there are systems, there are powers that must be defeated. And I want to make sure that my prayers 
are overly emphasizing the systems to fail, not the human being to be harmed. Now, there are some people who need accountability. I think of P. Diddy right now. All the stuff that's coming out about him. The brother needs accountability. But I pray that while he's in jail, probably for the rest of his life, accountability finds him. Right? Donald Trump needs a lot of accountability. I'm just giving you my own personal list, you know. You may have your own. <laughs> accountability. Warmongers. Drug and gun traffickers. Human traffickers. Pimps. Folks need accountability. But I also want us to appreciate that there are forces and powers that often possess these actors. Seduce these actors. God has gifted many the power and authority of influence. And rather than staying in the way of God, they get seduced by the forces of evil that are at work to harm the vulnerable. My prayer is God defeat their actions. Preserve their lives. Because if they are alive, they have the chance to be redeemed. Final story. I remember we were in Ferguson. And, you know, we was getting arrested. I've told the story before. I'm, I'm sorry I tell the same stories. I'm running out of stories. I don't know. But we were getting arrested. And Dr. West, myself, a few of us getting arrested. And, and you know, we, get, we in, the, in, the, in the holding tank. And, you know, we sitting there. And, 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 uh, and you know, uh, the, they, they, they booking us, fingerprinting us. I got my Hunter's Point mean mug on. I'm just. <laughs> Dr. West says, oh, God, God bless you, good brother. God bless you, good brother. What's this guy talking about? You know, I, I adore Dr. West. I wasn't saying this out loud. I was like, man, these people got us hemmed up in the St. Louis jail. He got bless you, good brother. Where you want me to stand? It's right here, right here. You know, just, you know, <laughs> mugshot, smiling. I'm like. So we get in, we get in the, in the jail cell, and we sit in there, and I'm like, Doc! What is, what is this, man? These people, man, they, they, they jacking us up, and you, God bless you, good brother. And, and he said, oh, Brother McBride, Brother McBride, Brother McBride. Always leave the porch light on. Because you never know when people are ready to come home. I, yeah, I just shut up right there. I just, just said. <laughs> and I'm like, you, don't you hate it when somebody give you an answer you can't even respond to? You just... <clears throat> It didn't help me. Yes, it did. It was that, that, that nasty medicine you need to live. There are actors that will come home if they can be extracted from the actions that they are often socialized to participate in. So my prayer is that you, you fail. Not you as a person, you as a purveyor of wickedness, your schemes. I pray they fail. What's this next set of questions? How can we learn to pray for the failure of the actions and the redemption of the actor? Does prayer help you discern the levels of wickedness around you and I? And I will say, finally, pray with your actions as well as your words. Listen, beloved, you and I, and I know I went long today, I apologize, but not really, not that much. Praise God. You and I are called to be people who are positioned to become the answer to one another's prayers. Inasmuch as God moves at times miraculously without the, 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 the generation, the through line of human people, I do believe some of the answers to the prayers we pray are people around us. And so God, help me to allow myself to be connected to folks who have the same values, the same commitments, so we can become the answers to one another's prayers. God, I don't just pray for housing. I ask God, can I be a solution? I don't just pray for justice. I pray, God, can I help be a agent of justice? I don't just pray for Hatred to end God, I ask, can I become love? I don't ask for violence to cease. I ask God, can I be a peacemaker? I want to 
become an answer to a prayer I pray. And I find that when you pray certain prayers, God is inviting you and I to ask ourselves, how can I become an answer through the power of God's spirit? Not just pray a prayer and it just goes into the sky. You just go on living your life as if God did not prompt you in your spirit to pray this prayer. God, I pray my enemies fail. And my prayer is, may their failure be accelerated by our faithfulness to the ways of God. Does that make sense to everybody what I'm saying? Their failure, their wicked schemes are defeated when the righteous join together and vote. <laughs> when the righteous join together and march. When the righteous join together and organize. When the righteous join together and teach. When the righteous join together and write. When the righteous join together and call for peace in the world. Use our money not to extract and exploit, but to build up and to support. We become an answer to our own prayer. Stand with us, everyone, as we prepare to pray. Francis of Assisi, he said it best like this, preach the gospel at all times and sometimes speak. I want to say that to you. Pray the gospel at all times and at all times. May we pray. Grab the hand of someone next to you. The song says, don't have to worry you know that song and don't you be afraid joy comes in the morning comes in troubles they won't last always remember there's a friend remember there's a friend in Jesus who wipes all your tears away who will wipe your tears away and when your heart is broken and when your heart is broken just lift your hands and say just lift your hands and say oh i know that i can make it i know that i i know that i can stand i know that i can stand no matter what comes my way no matter what may come my way my life is in your hands my life is in your hands God, I pray for the tan that I'm touching today. I pray, God, that you remind us today that our lives are in your hands. And because our lives are in your hands, oh God, you have the power to cause us the, the, the victory, the, the protection, the consciousness, the power to pray prayers that generate hope and healing and power. And so, God, as we navigate this tough season of meanness, where it appears our enemies are winning, where it appears advances are being made, misinformation, disinformation, hatred, malice, trauma, it is overflowing in so many directions. God, I pray that every person that I'm touching that finds themselves swept up in the anger, fear, and pain of this season, I pray, God, that you will give us peace that passes all understanding, protection from those who mean us harm, and a consciousness of those forces that are our true enemies. God, I pray that the enemies of our soul fail. I pray that the enemies of this system fail. I pray that those forces, those, 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 uh, 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 ideas, those, those, those structures that are often being held up by individual people. I pray that all of these things fail so the humanity, the spirit, the, 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 the Im Im imago dei, the image of God that is within each one of us will not be crushed under the weight of wickedness. 
So bless my beloved who I'm touching today. That which has been harmed by this enemy, by this system, I pray that the same healing that is made available through your spirit will be accessible to them right now. May God a miracle of healing visit them right now. May you mend the broken heart right now. May you ease the troubled mind right now. May you bring physical relief to the tense body right now. And may you, God, cause them to understand that there is peace, joy, and righteousness in the Holy Ghost. That there is love, there is unity, there is help. God, you are the helper. You are the one that sustains us. You are the one that brings us out of horrible pits. You are the one, God, that causes us to see the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. You are the great I am. And God, I pray that you will cause the Holy Spirit to touch right now. Break every yoke in a spiritual, powerful way. Break the bonds of depression and isolation. Break the manifestations of harm caused by wickedness. And may we, God, be conscious of the evil around us and pray for his failure. Now lift your hands right where you're standing. It's me, O oh Lord, and I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother. It is not my father. It is not my sister or my brother. But it's me, God, and I need you. Somebody say, I need you, Lord. I need you, God, to heal that part of me that is struggling. I need you, God, to bring new life to that part of me that is dying. I need you, God, to open my eyes and give me discernment so I can identify the real sources of pain and evil in my world. I need you, God, to help me get over bitterness, be healed from bitterness, be healed from anger, be healed, oh God, from harm and trauma, and bring God protection boundaries of protection around your people dealing with the wickedness of this age and we'll say thank you lord we'll say thank you lord may we partner may we pray may we be the answer to one another's prayers in jesus name we pray come on and give the lord a hand praise everybody come on come on can you give a two two people a high five and tell them i pray your enemies fail tell them that I pray your enemies fail. I pray they all just start to fall to the ground. Their plans, their schemes. I pray your enemies fail. Woo. Lord have mercy.